few more coming in. Um, <clears throat> thanks for being here, and just so we know the lay of the land this evening, uh, Pastor Hebner or Dr. Hebner uh, will go till about 7.20, 7.25, then we'll give a little break. If you want to leave, by all means, you can leave or use the restroom, whatever, and then we'll start our half-hour prayer service um, right at 7.30. So... Pastor Hebner was a few years behind me in school, um, was assigned um, to start a new mission, Palm Coast, Florida. Good, was down there for nine years, I was going to say ten, nine years. Took a call back to his alma mater, Wisconsin Lutheran High School, to serve as campus pastor. Um, while he was starting a new church, he went back to school on the side and got another degree from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and finished his doctorate once he got to Wisco, is that right? Um, has a doctorate from uh, Concordia, Fort Wayne. And so the, this, he thinks it's weird. I don't think it's weird. He wrote a book, okay? And so he doesn't want to be the guy that comes in here and waves his book around and says, buy my book. So I'll say, if you want to buy his book... <laughs> Um, we have copies of it, um, $20, and we'll have them in the... You can listen to him talk first and think whether or not you want to buy his book. Because I know you've listened to Pastor Berg, and you go, I don't know if it's worth, you know, I think it's going to be worth 20 bucks. So we're going to give Pastor Hebner, Dr. Hebner, 55 minutes on the floor. Thank you for being with us this evening. Let's give him a warm welcome, please. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Microphone is on. Good enough? Okay. Just wave if I need to be louder. Um, well, we have a little guide that was on the music stand on the way in. Um, you can follow along. You can write things down. You can be like my high school students and just draw pictures, too. You know, just doodle. Whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, don't, well, don't be like the students that sleep. Don't do that, right? Um, I guess uh, Pastor Bordelin did some of the introduction stuff, but here's a picture of my family if you're interested. I'm going to be doing a lot of slides on the screen here. Uh, so this is uh, me, of course, and my wife Becky, who was my classmate at Wisconsin Lutheran High School. Uh, she is a teacher. She was our preschool director in Florida. Now she teaches speech to all sophomores at Wisconsin Lutheran High School. So she has taught preschool and high school, which is great because preschoolers and high schoolers act the same way. So this is good. Uh, my son Noah is 14 and a freshman, so I have a teenager and a high schooler now. And Gwen is 11 in sixth grade, although she feels like she's 31 right now. So I served in um, Palm Coast, Florida with a new mission church, campus pastor. This is my sixth school year. And uh, yes, I got the doctorate degree, as he mentioned. So in case you're wondering, that does make me Dr. Phil. Um, this is what's great about high school kids. Someone paid another student $2. $2 to Photoshop my face and make it look like Dr. Phil. And uh, this was spread all around the campus. So, yeah, it's great. Oh, boy. Okay, well, let's kind of get into this. There's a lot of material, and I am going to try and squeeze it all in. So where did my thinking and research on this topic of family and faith start? Well, it started with this. Um, a, cer a certain wrinkling of the, the nose and a furrowing of the brow, kind of a, a writhing of the lips and, you know, that, that look like you want to just shoot lasers at somebody else. I like to call it the look. It's, it's one you want to pull your hair out and what's this look I'm talking about? We'll see if you can read what's on the screen. when people let their kids run around the sanctuary. You know the look when kids are kind of loud in church and you just want to turn around and... You're not going to say anything because that would be rude, but you look at them and you let them know, take that kid out. Well, I had a lot of experience with that look. We started this mission church and we were first worshiping in a public elementary school. All of our things were in a trailer. We unloaded. I mean, it was a very raw mission start with eight adults and three babies. And that includes me and my wife and our baby. <laughs> there was not many people and we had this little place and there was nowhere for children to go and people new to church would say when I knocked on their doors, do you have childcare at church? Because I'm not coming if you don't. 
you know, so what do you, what do, you do with all this? And we were blessed and we grew. This is our first Easter. There was like 75 people that came to our first Easter service. And again, I'm short on time, so I'll speed up a bunch. We were very blessed. We started a preschool at a separate warehouse and it grew and we were able to build a church. A very beautiful place, in fact, not too dissimilar from this. In fact, I think our chairs were maybe from the same company. And we had good acoustics like you have in here. And man, our little preschool was just blessed by Jesus. Um, it grew and grew and grew, and then we had another grade, and we added another grade, and we added another grade. By the time we had our opening service, after three and a half years, 200 plus people showed up. It was a packed house. We had vacation Bible school every summer, and nearly 250 children came to VBS. Here's a picture of a school chapel from my last year. Um, by the time I left, we had age one through eighth grade and nearly 400 students in our school. We started with eight adults. We had 52 employees when I left. <laughs> it was just, in, it was insane. Well, the issue was that there were kids everywhere. Here's a school Christmas service. You know how that goes with preschool and grade school, right? We would have a preschool service and a grade school service. 800 people showed up between the two of them. And there's just kids everywhere. And most of these people are new believers. And it was just loud. Um, because they didn't know what to do in church. And sometimes kids are under control, but there's just noise that comes with kids, you know, just from being there and kind of restlessness. And so we had that look happen a lot. And in fact, there were five members, members of the church who were over age 55 who left within five months. All those kids you have. And so this became a very personal issue for us to think about what do you do with kids in church and, and what about family and what about faith and raising children. Uh, and it made me think of this little picture here. Um, Let the little children come to me unless they're crying during my sermons, then give their parents the stink eye. Uh, and the bottom it says, things Jesus never said. Yeah. So I did a lot of thinking and research on this topic. This is what my thesis was on, what to do with children and church and family and faith. And I've been blessed now in ministry. I didn't know this was going to happen, but it just did, that I've dealt very closely with children from age one all the way up through high school and their parents on the whole journey now. Uh, so there's a lot of things I've noticed. So I'm going to move into some of the problems of today. I could talk forever about what's wrong with the world. I'm sure you could too. Um, but here are just some things that I'm noticing. Um, forgive me, I'm going to speak to you as teenagers do through little graphic images. Okay? Um, they're called GIFs or GIFs or GIFs, okay? So one thing I think is a promise is generational decay. So this is a GIF if you don't know, okay? Um, and so teenagers today, they say this, okay, boomer, to anyone who's older than they are. Um, that's their way of saying, like, you're old. Now, what they don't know is that not everyone is a baby boomer. They don't, they don't know that because they're teenagers. Um, but what I've noticed is over the generations, have you noticed this? especially those who have uh, more veteran years in this world, our world is declining, right? Morality is declining. And so if you think about going from the greatest generation that was tough and grit and take us through two world wars and the Great Depression, you know, through the silent generation, which is my grandparents who grew up during the Depression, um, into the baby boomers, my father is in that category of baby boomers where America exploded with jobs and money and construction and just children everywhere. Um, and now you start having things that my dad was a part of. So like Vietnam and hippies and rebellion and rock and roll and the sexual revolution. We think about all these things, right? And we keep marching down in time toward Generation X, which I'm at the very tail end of and um, the millennials, and you see technology entering the scene, and MTV music television, and people like Michael Jackson and Madonna, and now you don't just listen to controversial music, now you watch it in music videos, right? And then you just keep going as social media enters the picture, and now Generation Z, the, the teens today, it's just a crazy thing. It's a crazy thing. I have to remind my seniors often, 
you know, they're complaining about how many people watch their YouTube videos, and they're complaining about not getting enough likes on TikTok. Maybe some of you don't even know what TikTok is. Good, I'm glad you don't know. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're concerned about all this stuff, and I try and remind them, you do realize your peers, like 70 years ago, were on the beaches of Normandy. Right? You get that, right? You know, they're, they're, they're very emotionally soft today. Um, and the morality needle has just moved a lot. So if you're interested in learning about young people, um, this author has written two great books about millennials and Generation Z or the iGen. I refer to them on the back of the, of the sheet here. So one thing that's a problem, morality is declining as generations go by. Here's another thing. Parents are really struggling today. And here's my little graphic to help you. I love this. Watch the, watch the kid. Oh, oh, yeah, ah. Parents don't know. Uh, one more time, one more time. Yeah, okay. Uh, parents, man, they're struggling. They just don't know what to do. And I know some of the teachers are here. You found this. They don't know how to be parents. So there's the breakdown of the family. It is true that 50% of all marriages end in America. Um, the lack of fathers is an issue. Um, so 50% of marriages end, but not just in America, there's a 250% increase in divorce around the world. So it's not just us, it's, it's all over the place. 35% of children are born outside of marriage today in our country. It's, um, it's almost double in Milwaukee. Um, Generation X and millennial children so you know how everyone rushed to the altar after World War II to get married and have kids? Turns out those family, families weren't so ready to be parents um, because Generation X and millennial children who, um, who are now the parents of our high schoolers and all that, they just don't know what they're doing. They don't. Um, parents are overwhelmed with schedules. I mean, our, our family calendar looks like it's Egyptian hieroglyphics. You know, it's just, it's crazy. And we're carting kids all over the place and it's overwhelming. And parents have so much information from the internet, they don't know what to do. So in this book, The Rise of the Millennial Parents, one uh, principal from New Jersey identified like 55 different styles of parenting. I bet you know one. Helicopter parents, right? That's one style. He, uh, he identified another one. Black Hawk helicopter parents. Ah. So those are parents that kind of hover over their kids, but when you do something wrong, woo, they attack. And this is when teachers and coaches get emails. What did you do wrong? My kid got a C in your class. What did you do wrong? How are you going to fix it? Um, your kid didn't do homework. I don't know what you want me to say. You know, um, so my point is, parents are so overwhelmed with life and information, they really aren't sure how to be parents today. Children have become idols, like this famous movie, uh, Wayne's World, from back in the day. Parents just bow down to their children for every little thing. So they say things like, oh, I'll do anything for my baby. You know, um, this child, they post pictures on Facebook and they say, this is my world, this is my everything. Well, to the point that they keep pushing their kids to excel and to exceed. And so I know children who play a hundred baseball games and a hundred basketball games in one summer. And their kids sign them up for, or their parents sign them up for advanced classes and they push them and push them and push them. And guess what? When I see them in high school is when they finally crack because they can't take it anymore. They've been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, and they just lose it. Really, it's a focus on all the wrong and the worldly things uh, for families with their children. Children so overwhelmingly spoiled. Um, again, parents can be generous however they want, but I raise a little bit of an eyebrow when my daughter was in third grade and she tells me how her classmates got iPhones for Christmas. You know, I'm not sure that's a great choice. Um, so very spoiled children. And with that comes technology, and oh man, how technology affects our lives. Um, I could do in a whole nother hour just on screens, but do you know the average American spends over 70 hours a week looking at a screen? 70 hours. That's uh, 
That's almost three days, right? So the way we think and memorize and focus and give attention has changed. Some of you who love your classic movies from when you were younger, you watch the scenes are like one continual dialogue. But if you watch a cartoon today, the image changes every like three seconds. Bam, 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 bam. They're just continually flashing stuff in front of kids' faces. Um, and it's tough when you're teaching school or teaching catechism because you can't just teach them to memorize stuff or we're going to learn a map of Israel now. Kids don't care because they can Google a map of Israel. Right? I mean, there's just so many things that are changing with technology today. And screen time is big time linked to anxiety and depression. So I don't know if you know this, but there are books out there like this one that I read with research that shows if a kid looks at a screen for more than 10 hours in a week, like, oh, I don't know, Minecraft, Call of Duty, video games, right, or a phone, if they cross 10 hours in a week, their likelihood for anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts goes through the roof. At Wisco, more than 30% of our students spend over 30 hours a week looking at a screen. Yeah, it's, it's bad, okay? So technology influences. And then I like to say there's um, this, this thing in our culture which I call passed-off parenting. So, you know, you're a parent and it's like, here, take care of my child for me, okay? Um, so, for example, children become a commodity. Teenagers these days, we talk in my senior religion class about re relationships and marriage, and they talk about kids and say, oh, I don't know, a kid? Maybe I'll have one of those one day. Well, it's not like a pair of shoes, you know? It's, they're blessings. They're not just a commodity to get or acquire. Um, and, you know, child care becomes so expected. Have you noticed this? Um, well, I guess before COVID, McDonald's and uh, Chick-fil-A have to have a play place. You want to go work out at the YMCA? They got child care. You want to buy a Swedish lamp at Ikea? They have child care. And so I found this at church. People come to church, and what do they expect? Child care? Take my kid down the hallway. Go take care of him. Passed off parenting. Um, what else is wrong? I'm going to try and wrap this up quickly. I'll skip past the images. This is a very post-Christian era in America. Do you know that? 50% of Americans say they are post-Christian. Like, maybe I was raised that way, but I'm not Christian anymore. 60% of Americans are unchurched or dechurched. There are more Americans right now that identify as atheist or nothing than ever before in American history. Guess which generation has the most? Generation Z, the teens. Yeah. So if you're interested, I, I list these books on the back. If you want to learn more about this and people who are like spiritually nothing and leaving the church, there's some great... Um, books and resources there. And so, yes, we are losing our youth. Children are just like, I'm out, I'm leaving, I'm gone. So I referenced a lot of books. Here's one of our own studies, okay? Um, there was a study done by our Wisconsin Synod and Pastor John Hine. And he notes that the Wisconsin Synod is down 34 to 50 percent or more in various groupings of youth. 88 percent of our Wells youth express critical doubts about their faith when go, going off to college. 88%. Um, teens, I find, are just completely lost in culture. So I, I was talking with Pastor Bodie before we started, and I mentioned that this is almost what I spend all of my time on. Our own Wells teens are so drowning in the world that this is what I spend every minute on. In fact, just today... Um, <laughs> I, had, I was talking with two girls for one hour. One was sexually assaulted in the first degree, which is really bad. Another was in the third degree by the same person at different times. Um, one had been cutting and wanted to kill herself, and I had been working with her on that. Another one I was working with a different hour who was struggling with her sexuality and not sure if she's attracted to boys or girls. And, you know, they're just so drowning right now, and this is a big problem. And so what's going on here? Uh, what do we do with children today? 
And what do we do with teens today? And I'll admit to you that this is what I'm thinking through and I'm researching and I'm reading about this as I'm working on my thesis. And I come back to Wisconsin and I'm working on it some more here now while I'm at Wisco. And all of a sudden the light bulb goes on in my head. And I felt kind of foolish because I'm asking these questions. What do we do with children? What do we do with teens? And then I realize, ah, it's the wrong thing. Because you're not born worse in church today. Or you're not born more sinful today. Right? All the things that we see are in the culture are things that you are raised up with. You know, poor parenting, a lack of parenting, parents not present, or any, any combination of those things. And so really this becomes a parenting issue. Um, and so I wonder if history repeats itself. You might not be able to see this, uh, but here's a quote from uh, Martin Luther. He's writing to Nicholas von Amsdorf. Maybe some of you have seen this. This is in some books like the introduction to the catechism, I guess you could say. Here's what Martin Luther said. Oh, the deplorable, wretched deprivation that I recently encountered while I was a visitor it has constrained and compelled me to prepare this catechism or Christian instruction in such a brief, plain, simple version. Dear God, what misery I beheld. Leave it to Luther to say it nicely, right? Um, the ordinary person, especially in the villages, knows absolutely nothing about the Christian faith. And unfortunately, many pastors are completely unskilled and incompetent teachers. Praise God, I don't think that applies so much you know, for sure to this church, okay? Uh, not saying anything about your pastors here. Um, yet supposedly they all bear the name Christian. They're baptized. They receive the Holy Sacrament. And even though they do not know the Lord's Prayer or the Creed or the Ten Commandments, and as a result, they live like simple cattle or irrational pigs. And despite the fact that the gospel has returned, they have mastered the fine art of misusing their freedom. <sighs> Could history be repeating itself? Where parents are failing and Christianity is losing its hold because it's not being taught to children. That's why Martin Luther wrote the catechism to help with that. And I wonder if maybe we can return to reviewing how we train up children in the faith. Okay? So if you're following along in the little guideline, if you want to fill in the blank, I'm noting that our problems today are really a parenting problem. This is a parenting issue. And so, let's talk a little bit about some things. I'm going to have to speed along here, so forgive the quick clicking, but I think a lot of this is review. So if we review what the Bible says, we notice that children are a blessing. God told us to be fruitful and multiply. We notice in Psalm 127, children are a reward. Again, a heritage, a blessing from God. We know these wonderful words of Psalm 139, how the Lord has knit us together and made us so wonderfully, all of our lives planned out, just a beautiful thing. We know the words from Moses. Do you remember that, how he told them, teach this to your children, teach it to your children, over and over again. Again, I'm, I'm skimming fast here because I think we're f mostly familiar with some of these passages. Deuteronomy chapter 6, impress them on your children. Talk about it at home when you lie down, when you wake up. Make it a part of your life, Moses said. Psalm 78 says the same thing. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. We will not hide them from their children. We're going to tell the next generation what our God has done. So, so important. Pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. Remember Joshua's? As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. What we need to work on is continuing to have families with this Joshua-like mantra, serving the Lord. And so as I read through the entire Bible with the viewpoint of parenting and children and all that kind of stuff, there are some things that I noticed. So here's some key thoughts. Children are a blessing, a wonderful privilege from God, not a commodity or a nuisance or a hassle. Well, maybe my kids are, but most other kids, they aren't. Children are uniquely created, uniquely cared for by God. Children ought to be disciplined. One thing I hope I have time for at the end is I think we can help families a lot by just teaching parents how to discipline. 
I find that parents really don't know much on how to discipline their children these days. Um, children ought to be taught the ways of the Lord, right? These are some basic, simple things. And parents are the ones called to teach the children. Yes, the church gets involved. Yes, the community gets involved, or in our case, a Lutheran elementary school. But it's parents who should be teaching their children the ways of the Lord. And so as these thoughts, sorry, as these thoughts were going through my mind, I started noticing this all over the Bible, like Cain and Abel. So how did Cain know what a bad offering was? And how did Abel know what a good offering was? There's no other explanation except their parents taught them. Adam and Eve taught them, right? How would they know what an offering is? Or how about Abraham and Isaac? Do you remember the test of faith when they went up the, the hillside and there was that gut-wrenching question from Isaac? Where's the offering? Well, how would Isaac know unless he had done it before and was taught this act of worship, right? Or what about Solomon when he dedicated the temple? And you find these little nuggets all over the Bible. Here's what it says when Solomon dedicated the temple. King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel gathered there for that big event, for that act of worship. Or how about Josiah? Do you remember that story from the Bible? They discovered God's word. The law was uncovered. And what happened? It says when Josiah got the law, um, the priest went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people from least to greatest, from youngest to oldest. And he read in their hearing the words of the book of the covenant. I mean, you think children are bored during a Bordelin sermon. I mean, man, how about the the entire reading of the law. <laughs> ah, but they were there. Children brought them. John, your sermons are great. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, after they came back from captivity and Ezra confesses the sins of the people, what does it say? Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping, throwing himself before the house of God, and a large crowd gathered men, women, and children confessing sin, coming to the Lord in repentance. Joel urged repentance. The prophet, what does he say at the end? Gather those children, even those nursing at the breast. He didn't say, oh, they're going to be too noisy. No, don't bring them. Right? Bring them, bring them to the Lord for this important thing. So there's some other Bible examples like, oh, baby John the Baptist. We don't want to make too much of this story, but you remember how he reacted in the womb uh, in joy. Or the boy Jesus, who's in the temple. This is God's house where I belong as a 12-year-old boy. Or how about the Sermon on the Mount? I don't remember anything in the story about Jesus going on with this long, 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 long sermon and the parents first dropping their kids off at child care. Yeah. How about the feeding of the 5,000? or the feeding of the 4,000. Do you remember how those numbers were counted? At the end of the story, it says, and the number of men was 5,000, not counting women and children. P.S., they were there. Right? So, again, when the people came to Jesus, they brought their children with. How about Jesus in Nazareth on the Sabbath? And he goes and he speaks uh, remember where they invited him up front? He unrolls the scroll of Isaiah, right? And he's got this thing. Notice how he didn't say, I got a really doozy of a sermon for you. Please send the kids down the hallway to Sunday school Sabbath, you know, children's Sabbath church. No, they were all there. They were all there together. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. This is one that always hurt me. People are so quick to dismiss kids down the hallway or get rid of them or whatever. And Jesus is the first to welcome and bring them to the center as examples. Um, yeah, children as examples of, a faith, of faith. Or how about some other things? Peter's Pentecost sermon, this massive event where the Holy Spirit comes and blesses the church and he calls them to repent. And what does he say? This promise is for you and your children. Repent and be baptized, all of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Or at the end of Acts chapter 2, where it says all the Christian church would gather every day, all the believers, 
Not just the old ones or the well-behaved ones. All of them. Or you remember in uh, Philippi, Lydia and the jailer at Philippi, they and their entire families were baptized. Or, or how about this? This dawned on me, I want, like a light bulb went on again. Do you remember that um, the early letters written by Peter and Paul were read? They were expected to be read when the believers gathered for worship, right? Okay, so that's step one. Step two, Paul writes in two of his letters, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Okay, let's think about this. If those letters were read when they gathered for worship, and if Paul is addressing children in the letters, then he's probably expecting children will be there in worship when it's read, right? Uh, so again, this is just a regular practice. So what can we say? Children almost always seem to be with their parents for acts of worship, going to the temple, the Sabbath. The whole faith community gathered together and worked on this. Children became examples of faith in life, in worship. Um, so lots of things for us to think about. I'll talk about what does that mean for us in, real, in the real world in just a few minutes. I'll probably spend the least amount of time on this. I could go on um, on it for a while, but I'll touch on just science a little bit. You can read a number of books. I read this one, which is a New York Times bestseller. Uh, really interesting, Lisa Miller spent 15 years researching spirituality in children. Guess what she found out? Clinically, scientifically proven, children are spiritual. Duh. Yeah, like we know that from the Bible, right? Uh, but here's a scientist who says, everything I've, ob I've observed says that kids reach out for spiritual things. I think a lot of you have noticed that. Um, I'll summarize this quote. She says, and children learn spiritually the most by how their parents love them. Now she did all this science mumbo jumbo, <laughs> but we know from the Bible, this is exactly what God designed. How do you learn about the love of a heavenly father? Except from your father and mother, etc. right? Um, so it's interesting how science even backs up what God designed. Some more things, um, so, like uh, child psychology, developmental psychology. Cognitive development proceeds as a result of dynamic reciprocal transaction of internal and external factors. Right? Let me translate Nature and nurture work together. So it's not just like how children are born or that, you know, not only are they naturally sinful but naturally gravitating towards spiritual things. It's, again, how they're raised. What do we know about this? Children learn best by parent example. Science tells us that. Children learn socially. We know that. That's why COVID was really bad news, right? Children learn socially. Children learn through repetition. My um, office in Florida was down the hallway from our preschool. Days of the week. Days of the week. There's Sunday and there's my... If I heard that song one more time, just... Ah! Um, but that's how kids learn, right? Repetition over and over and over again. Children learn actively by doing. And children learn through their senses. Sight, smell, touch. Now just think about this page. It's almost like... God so blessed his church that he would give us a certain liturgy where people repeat and worship together and children can watch their parents and senses are involved with sight and sound and um, smell, candles and incense and that churchy smell and taste in communion and colors and I mean, just think about what God has blessed us with in the liturgy that does exactly what developmental psychology says is best for kids. It's pretty cool. Church history. Again, I'll go fast here. I'm going to skip this page, okay? What has church history shown us? If you read a lot of old stuff, you'll find children frequently participated in church, in worship. Um, from the earliest days on, 
Children were active liturgically as lectors reading scripture lessons. Um, <laughs> I forget which guy it was. It was like Chrysostom or one of those early church fathers. There's even a record of him having a child reader of a scripture reading during church who was five years old. I don't know how that would have worked, but they did it. Maybe, well, maybe like this. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be... Just like the Christmas children's service, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but children were, were participating. There were children's choirs that led in singing. Um, some other things. History shows us children are always brought to the font and baptized. Um, children of varying ages communed with adults. For hundreds of years, even children communed with adults. I'll come back to that point later. What did Martin Luther say? Luther wrote that he believed the Reformation and change should happen through the young people. We've got to train the children, and that's how we're going to make changes. Luther wrote that home and church and school need to all be on the same page helping parents and children. So I'm getting towards something that applies to you here, right? Church, home, school, all on the same page. Luther wrote about the father as the pastor, in his words, the priest of the household. We need to train men, fathers, to take the spiritual lead. Do you know that a lot of the hymns Martin Luther wrote were meant to teach? Do you know that? Um, especially for children. So, um, from heaven above to earth I come to bear good news. You know that hymn, right? That was meant to be a riddle for children. Who is this one who comes from heaven above to earth? And so as the stanzas of that Christmas hymn unfold, they reveal to families and to children the good news of the Savior. Um, so they, Luther had children's liturgical choirs. Luther had children lectors. Even Martin Luther communed children at age eight. Interesting. Um, we're doing okay. I, I'm done at 25, is that right? 725? I'm hanging in there for time. I got to read to you this Luther quote, because you're going to love it. You're going to love it. This is super uh, Luther-esque. I'll read fast. Luther says, if we want capable, qualified people for both the civil and spiritual realms, we really must spare no effort, time, and expense in teaching and educating our children to serve God and the world. We must not think only of amassing money and property for them. God can provide for them and make them rich without our help. When I read this in class with my teens, it really hurts. Because their, their parents just push them to get scholarships, get money, achieve, perform. And what does Luther say? God can make kids rich without parents. That's not what he wants you to do. As indeed he does daily. But he has given us children and entrusted them to us precisely so that we may raise and govern them according to his will. Otherwise, God would have no need of fathers and mothers. It gets better. Think what deadly harm you do when you are negligent and fail to bring up your children to be useful and godly. You bring upon yourself sin and wrath, thus earning hell by the way you have reared your own children, no matter how holy and upright you may be otherwise. Because this commandment is neglected, God terribly punishes the world. Uh, you think this is a little prophetic? Listen to what he says. And hence, there is no longer any discipline, government, or peace. We all complain about this situation, but we fail to see it's our own fault. And so I wonder, as we look at America today and see all kinds of problems that we all complain about, could we perhaps do better by helping people to train up the next generation? Um, kids these days are very active. They want to do stuff. They want to make changes. And so when we talk about this in class, I say, you want, to, you want to make a change and end racism? Then train your children not to be racist. You want to make a change and not have people like storm the Capitol building and people die? Then train your kids to be respectful. You want to end all this mess on social media where people talk about each other and do all? Then train your kids how to use it right 
right? So that's what Luther is saying, is we need to really, man, get going with our training in Christian families to make a difference in this world. So, with that said, I'll move on to some solutions and ideas and suggestions. I'm going to throw a lot of stuff out at you. Take what you want. You can talk about as a congregation or a school what you want. Maybe we'll spur some conversations. Whatever. So number one, some solutions for the home. If you're following along, I'm on the back side of the handout here. Uh, again, just a little outline there. Uh, number one, parents really need to grow themselves in faith. Uh, we focus so much on children, but I think many more initiatives could be focused toward parents. Churches offering marriage enrichment regularly. Parenting classes regularly. You know, personal Bible devotion time in the home. If we want strong Christian parents, they need to be strong in Christ first. Um, we need to help parents know how to discipline. I don't have time, but I could tell you so many funny stories <laughs> about children who just lack discipline. But I, I'm sure you see them on your own too, right? But we need to help parents with this. Um, and parents need to double down on a fancy word, catechesis, which just means forming the Christian faith in children. Uh, here's a really good book that Concordia Publishing House produced about teaching the faith at home. Maybe it could be referenced. I'm sure it's on one of the shelves already here uh, at St. John's. Um, but we need to emphasize a devotional life at home. I think we've gotten used to the convenience of American Christianity. And so you pop in for church for an hour. Maybe your kids go to a Lutheran elementary school. And otherwise, you never talk about Jesus ever. You know, this religion of convenience. So for us to help families to have a devotional and worship life at home, I think, is a really important thing. Personal Bible reading time, a use of the catechism. There's a brand new hymnal. Yeah. A use of the new hymnal and a lot of the cool resources in that. By the way, the new hymnal has inside of it the catechism. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um... You know, and how can we teach homes, for example, to better reflect the life of the church? I think a lot of families do advent calendars because chocolate's fun. <laughs> um, but can we help families to grow in maybe having a personal advent wreath or celebrating the baptisms of their children? They go all out for birthday parties. Can they celebrate baptisms as well and give gifts for that? Just some examples. There are some really great books out there. If we want to raise kids to be in church, Whisper, Whisper is a good um, book that helps kids to kind of think through that. Um, there are some good board books um, by Cloria. I think I have that website here. Cloria, like God's own child, I gladly say it, a magnificent baptism hymn made into a children's book. It's cool. Um, this one's written by a classmate of mine from the Missouri Synod. Um, my little ABC liturgy book. So things like this that can teach kids. CPH and NPH has a lot of resources for that. Um, I'm going to skip over this quickly, but say that we need to work a lot, especially on men. When a father attends church regularly, the retention rate of keeping a child in the church for life rises 75%. When family devotions are held regularly, the retention rate is 80% more than on average. These are important things, and statistics would back it up. How about in the school? You know, can, can teachers continue to incorporate worship concepts? I'll give you one easy example. When John the Baptist comes up in Christlight and the school, walk them down the hallway and bring them to the baptismal font and talk about like the, the symbolism of the church and what the font means and you know the paschal candle and you know all this kind of stuff now, how can you incorporate thoughts about worship so that when kids who are in the elementary school come here on sunday morning they're very ready to be a part of the church um maybe yeah okay thanks um maybe this happens already but um it doesn't at every place. 
coordinating hymnology with the pastors. You know, like, what hymns are the kids going to learn? And what are we actually going to sing on Sunday morning? You know, to have those be the same thing is, is good. Using kids for liturgical choirs. I say this now all over. We have this cool new hymnal that's being released, and it's out now. Um, kids are really good at learning songs and shouting them out. How easily we can teach to churches the new stuff in the hymnal through the children. That's always what, that's what Martin Luther did. You know, we could do the same. Um, promoting the arts is important. I'm going to skip along a little bit here because I got like the warning from the back about 10 minutes left here. Um, how about in the church? I, I mention this a lot of times. <coughs> Parents need to do more training. Um, as parents, we need to train parents as the church, but we also need to train them about worship. When I did my thesis, I surveyed 200 Wells families across the country. You know what, you know what they said? 92% of Wells parents say they have received no training on how to engage their children in worship. That the churches are not helping them to know how do I get my kid active in church. You know, so they're kind of like looking for help. And children need training in how to worship. Um, so some other things, you know, to get children active in worship, children's choirs, I mentioned, um, acolytes, you know, maybe you do some of this stuff already. Junior ushers, can children help with the ushering or the gathering of the, the offering? Encouraging families to sit up, this is dangerous, this is dangerous, but encouraging families to sit up front because kids are wide-eyed when they see, you know, all the sights and the sounds and colors and stuff. I'm going to, I'll skip this part because I'm short on time here. Um, you know, making use of teens, I always recommend as ushers um, in the technology stuff, teens as lectors or musicians or soloists, teens in ministry canvassing or helping in the school, helping the needy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, okay. I'm going to go to this point because we're, again, a little short on time, but I think I'll make it. I think we really need to rethink as a synod how we use the catechism. Um, not only getting parents more involved, um, but also continuing to push. And I know a lot of people are doing great stuff with that, that it's not just like an eighth grade confirmation and now you're done and you're ready for high school. Because they're not. I'll tell you as a high school teacher, they're not ready. Okay? And so if I wanted to stir the pot with seven minutes left and then run out the back door as fast as possible, I would maybe suggest, in my mind, what if we did confirmation at like sixth grade and did, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade catechism? Um, sixth grade, they started communing. Maybe they had two years of commun communing life, sacramental life, with parents, with teachers, with pastors, before they go to high school? And what if seventh and eighth grade, then, instead of memorizing the Tenth Commandment and its meaning, was more like apologetics, like how to defend your faith? Because guess what? All the stuff of the world is already in their hand and their phones anyways. You know, what if 7th and 8th grade was more practical, how to live your life, and even like service project type stuff? I, I just wonder if we maybe rethought it a little bit of like 8th grade, now you're done. That could help a little bit. Remember, the church has been communing children younger than 8th grade for hundreds of years, you know? Uh, so maybe we just need to think about that a little bit. Um, I also am a, a big proponent of we need to rethink youth groups and teen groups. When I grew up, Teen groups meant we would go to the Pettit Center and skate, and we would sleep in the church once a year for a lock-in, and then we'd have pizza parties. Well, I mean, that's fun. Kids like hanging out with each other, so that's good. But I'll tell you, they're going to go skate anyways. They're going to always eat pizza, and they always stay up all night with their friends. You know, so you're not doing anything special as a church if that's, if that's what youth group is. I'm finding that young people today, especially like middle school and teens, want to be really, really active with their faith. They want to have a purpose and a meaning. So can I give you an example? And this is how I'll transition toward the end, okay? As we're talking about raising and training kids. I have had the unique blessing of being all, literally all over the world with young people. This is up in the mountains in Yellowstone National Park. We were on a mission trip. 
Uh, there is a child of the congregation right here. Here's Carter Robbie. This is in Alaska uh, on a mission trip. We went horseback riding. We also did Jesus stuff too. Um, I, you know, at, at Wisco, we do a service project where we collect twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars every year for a mission. And one year, not only did we do this because kids were so excited about it, I actually went to Africa and delivered the motorcycles that we bought for the pastors there. Life-changing experience for the kids to serve and to help those who are in need. This is kind of my life right now. This is a mission trip to uh, California where I, I just don't know what's going on and there's kids who are just everywhere. Uh, we were in San Diego on a mission trip. I've been to Antigua. On a, uh, well, Carter's in this one too, so man, lots of backstories with, with Carter Rabbi, I guess. Uh, I won't say them out loud on video right now. Um, and so what happened on one of these mission trips, um, we're in San Diego, and this is the actual picture, and the pastor there, Pastor Aaron Baim, a uh, great guy, uh, one, once a week just goes to a homeless shelter and, and talks to people, just loves them and passes out food. And so we went to this homeless shelter and we brought food, and I'm telling you, pretty much every single person in that picture is very much high middle class, okay? They've never done anything like this. And so we go there that night and we pass out food to these families and we get in the car and these kids say, I have never done anything more important in my entire life. I would do that every day if I could. And so they, and we would come back to the pastor's house and just sit around the fire and we would talk about Jesus and they would, you know, ask the pastor questions and they would all cry because kids don't talk to each other anymore. They look at their phones, right? And we just talk about life. So we got back um, and this team right here, these seven kids were like, can we have a life talk again? Can we just talk? And I said, okay, come on over. You know, Saturday we'll make you breakfast at my house. Come on over. Um, so they came over for a life talk. We read Psalm 1. And they said, this is great. Can we come over again? I said, okay, well, it's the summer. Come on over next Saturday. So we read Psalm 2 and had more breakfast than bacon. And they said, this is great. Can we bring friends? And so they came the next week. And then all of a sudden, school started, and we moved to Wednesday night. And almost every Wednesday for two years teens come to my house and they just they just come in they just come in and they go in my fridge and my children love them and they just sit around the table but eventually we go downstairs and we do bible study and after two years we read through all 150 psalms and uh we talk about life and you know lots of tears talking about what jesus means to them as we gather around and i, I think now we did this through covid I'll wrap up with some pictures here. Um, we were careful with COVID. We moved outside during the summer. And week after week, I think over two years, some 2,000 kids have passed through our home. But here's what I've learned. For someone to care about them as young people and to listen to them and to spend time with them and to pass along the faith in a meaningful way and to give them a purpose is what they absolutely love. And so I'd love to stay for a Compline with you. I love Compline service. But in fact, they are gathering at my house in about 30 minutes. <laughs> and we're going to do more Bible study tonight because we have stuff to talk about with life. Uh, so I'll say this. Um, when do you say these words? Anytime there's a baptism. Right? And now the child's baptized, the congregation raises, uh, rises, and what does the pastor say? If you are willing to do anything, anything, to help this child continue in the faith, then answer yes as God gives me strength. And you know what? I've never heard anyone say no. We all say it. Now my question is, what can we do together as home, church, and school gather and work together to have families like this focused on Christ and the cross. You have such wonderful people here. I know you'll continue to work on that. It's been a pleasure to be here and to share some thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Hebner. We're going to let him run so he can go do his vocation of being a campus pastor and being with those kids. So thank you, Pastor Hebner.
uh, was recorded tonight, and we'll make that video available if you think there's people in your friends and family that can benefit. I think we'll have opportunity to continue this conversation um, in further studies here at St. John's. So, good. His book is directed more towards high schoolers. It's for teens. Yeah. For teens. It says it right on the cover. It does. It does say it on the cover. So there are copies of it um, in the back, and we'll also have it in the church office um, in the weeks to come. So you don't have to stay for evening prayer, so you can go. It's about a five-minute break. Um, there are service folders if you are staying 